that's why we yeah. can see everything. Yes. Rania, some people are facing a problem with connecting. Can you please double check that uh, it's allowing people to enter to the meeting? Because yes, I, I received several. Uh, we already uh, have attendees. Uh -huh. at yes, I know, but maybe there is uh, something that needs to be fixed. Can you please? Because I, I received the, the same message, exactly the same message from four different people. Can you please uh, tell me what is the message? What does the message say? Trying to sign into the webinar, but there is something wrong. Uh, the link is not correct. Unable to connect. Unable I to log in to attend the webinar. Yeah, I had that before, and it's just, they want to be admitted usually. Uh, but here uh, we're keeping it open for anyone who is uh, just uh, they need to sign in to Zoom. Maybe they don't have Zoom because um, uh, Amir wants to talk. C c I will allow him to talk, please, Amir Wisa, Mr. Amir. Tfadal. Laufi. Sarkhir. Tanur. Tfadal. Amir. Uh, and, uh, I can see you, I can see you, but uh, it's not like every time. It, it's a bit sophisticated this time. Uh, can you see me or you just uh, hear my voice? We can hear your voice only. Yeah, I can see you, but uh, like uh, every time the mute of the, of the, of the video is not there. Uh, the audio is there, but the video, I can only see uh, raise hand, chat. Uh, yes, because this is a webinar, it's not a meeting. Uh, the setup is different in order to accommodate more people. So the setup oh. is sort of, of a webinar, uh, not like the usual uh, small groups one, because this is open for everyone. Uh, that's why we're making it in a form of a webinar, and the participants can only raise their hands or write questions um, and, and, and talk. Okay, but, uh, but uh, you cannot see us, only uh, voice. Yes. Okay, but I can see you. Yeah, great. You can see the panelists, the ones who are going to talk and uh, the panelists of the event. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Esme. You're welcome, Amir. I think we can start. Um, we already have almost 20 attendees, so we can start and other people can join when they're able to join. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll switch to Arabic. Uh, just for the introduction, and then we uh, we switch again to English. مساء الخير جميعا. شكرا على مشاركتكم النهاردة معنا. النهاردة إحنا لمشروع جي تكس مينا تكس. المشاركة مش بس من ال ال beneficiaries بتوع المشروع. لا إحنا عندنا إحنا فتحنا الدعوة لل مجموعة الويبنارز دي لكل القطاع بتاع التكستايل اند كلوذنج في مصر علشان يقدروا يستفيدوا بالمعلومات السيري السيريز اوف ويبنارز او مجموعة الندوات اللي معمولة بنبتديها النهاردة هما خمس ندوات هيبتدوا من النهاردة ولمدة شهرين هيبقى عندنا خمس ندوات مختلفة في مواعيد مختلفة زي ما كان مبعوتة بالايميل في, في الجدول وطبعا قبل كل واحدة هنبعت ريمايندر عليها علشان نضمن ان الناس تبقى فاكراها بس هي مواعيد مش هتتغير فانتوا حطوها عندكم في الكالندر علشان علشان تقدروا يعني تحضروا معانا سريعا نبذه سريعه عن مشروع جي تكس مينتكس هو مشروع بينفذه مركز التجاره الدوليه اي تي سي انترناشونال تريد سنتر وهو للي مش عارف مين هو اي تي سي هي منظمه التابعه للامم المتحده ولمنظمه التجاره العالميه دبليو تي او هي المنظمه اللي بتشتغل على مساعده الشركات ومن الدول الناميه ان هي تقدر تشارك في التجاره العالميه المشروع بتاع جي تكس مينا تكس بيتنفذ في ست دول مختلفه مصر منهم تشمل كمان تونس والمغرب والأردن وكيرجستان وتاجيكستان في أسيا وهو مشروع مدعم من الحكومة السويسري والحكومة السويدي فأنا برحب بيكم جميعا النهاردة لو طبعا في ناس مش مش يعني مش بيستفيدوا من المشروع موجودين معنا النهاردة لو عايزين يعرفوا معلومات أكتر بعد كده ممكن طبعا تتواصلوا معايا من خلال الإيميل أو التليفون ممكن أسيبه لكم كمان على الشات ولو حابين تشاركوا لان احنا لسه عندنا فرصه لان شركات تقدر تشارك 
أنا بس هرجع تاني الإنجليزي دلوقتي علشان إحنا السيدة اللي معانا الأكسبرت بتوعنا كلهم من أمريكا والساعة عندهم الساعة سبعة الصبح دلوقتي فعلشان كده ده سبب إن إحنا مبتدين آخر اليوم علشان على الأقل يبقوا هما اليوم عندهم ابتدى وأنا برحب بيكوا تاني وهيبقى في أي حد عنده أسئلة يحطها في الـ في الشات أو في الـ Q&A وإحنا هنبقى بنرد عليها تباعا خلال السيشن شكرا جزيلا وبرحب بيكوا تاني. Um, so I, I finished the introduction in, in Arabic and I'll give you the, the word now. The floor is yours, Jill. You can, uh, you can share the presentation. You will be the one sharing the presentation, right? The slide. Yes, I will. Okay. I'll go ahead and so, start sharing now. Okay, so you can start sharing and uh, I'll be on. Okay. Can, can, you, see my, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So, so thanks, Jill. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Peter Kilduff. Uh, so I'm going to um, uh, be the master of ceremonies, I guess, for today's presentation. Um, today, we're going to give you a presentation about um, important requirements for conducting business with US companies. And um, if we can go to the next screen, Jill, um, I'd like to share who's um, on this presentation with me. Pardon me, one, one moment, Peter. I'm just having some fun here. Hold on a second. Yes, and I am the technology person, so that's fantastic that I can't make this work. Okay. One moment, please. Take your oh. time. All right. Not sure what's happening, but give me just a second and I'll see what I can do here. There we go. Should be working now. Let's try this again. Yes, it's starting to share, Jill. There we go. Okay. Yes, okay, sorry, that go. should be working. Thanks, Jill. So these are our five pre presenters today. So um, um, uh, first of all, we'll hear from uh, Anne Kristen Erdman Burt and then Francis Harder. Uh, Jill Mazur, who's um, curating the slides for us um, for the first part of the presentation, uh, Meditha Senanayaka, and myself, Peter Kilduff. All of us um, have extensive experience working uh, with um, international companies in the apparel and textile field. And, and um, so um, I hope that you enjoy this presentation. So I'd like to hand over to, to Anne to kick us off. Hey, hello everybody. Uh, good to see you or meet you and um, thank you for attending this webinar. Today we're going to cover a couple of important topics to conduct business with the US. We got, first, we're going to talk about US business culture in general. The second one are the societal changes and movements currently really relevant in the United States. Then we go into business communication negotiating with the US, legal considerations, and sustainability as a last part. And I'm going to jump right in with US business culture. And maybe as a pretext for also this webinar, the United States, of course, is a melting pot of different nationalities, of different cultures, different religions, which makes it also so interesting to, to do business with the United States. It's an extremely big country. Um, and of course, everything we are, we are talking about, it depends always on like, probably when you meet people and get to know them best better, they, they are not all the same, obviously. So um, we're gonna give sh some general guidance and starting with some enduring characteristics, as you know, and most of you are doing a lot of business with the, with the US, um, Americans are very direct or the way to do business and the communication is very direct. And in a later slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the, the way a communication also in comparison to other countries works in a low context and high context. Humor is a really important part of the culture. You will find it like even probably when you listen to um, when we talk before the webinar starts, there's always a little bit of humor. It's really important to also um, 
get a good mood into meetings, into also before negotiations start. That means also um, small talk is a very important part in the United States. And uh, going further here, when we look at the differences of regions, and I mentioned that in my first sentence, the United States is big. Um, when I talk to European companies or in Germany, they are always like, they think of America as one piece many times. And um, basically it's like the Europe with all different countries. Every state has different characteristics when you, and a lot of you have been traveling to the United States and have been doing business here, you know that the East Coast differs massively from the West Coast. So if you talk to people in LA, they will always be like this, hey, how are you doing? And smiling while in the East Coast, it's more like, okay, come on, what's next? Let's do business. Um, so definitely important to, to note um, that dif there's differences in each state um, also in the US. Can I, can I just jump in there a yes. second? Then? And, and you're absolutely right. It's, 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 um, the, it's not right to think of the US as an homogenous whole, as, as being uniform across the whole country. There are significant regional differences, but it's not as sharp as in Europe, where it's a, it's a series of nation states with different languages, different cultures. And, and the US has its differences are more subtle, but they are important. May I just say something as well for a sure. quick moment? So I, I believe I'm the actual only American on the call. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to take one for the team. I will take one for the United States of America here. So whatever it is you want us to say about America, I will accept it and uh, go with it. But um, to Anne's point, we are a very, very diverse country um, with probably the most um, representation of religions and of cultures, of races and of um, nationalities on the entire planet. So I am definitely not the actual only representative of America here today. No, well, we are actually, we are, we are American, I think. We've got our citizenship. We've, we've, yes. We were born yes. outside of America, but we chose to come to America because we love it. But yeah. it is incredibly diverse. If it is, it is diverse. It. It is diverse, yes, and sorry, my point was that regional differences are significant, but not quite as sharply contrasting as in Europe, but the overall diversity in America is, 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 is quite strong in any one place, and, and more so than you'd find in, in most countries outside of uh, global cities. Hey, nice. Thank you, everybody, for jumping in. I think that's a really important like note also for everybody. You can see we are the melting pot as well. Um, and that's why it's also so, so nice to discuss all of these topics and we can answer all your questions from different perspectives. Um, also, what, what's um, another important point are the, is the informality. All of you know that we talk with on a first name basis. We would say, I'm just Anne. And um, if I go to Germany, for example, definitely it's very formal. Everything is in the communication formal. Um, but still, even though it's informal in some ways, it's still very formal in the business part. And also important to notice that um, the part of the so society can be very conservative. If we look at communication, we're gonna talk more about that later, but um, we have like little important things like how important written communication, of course, is like, I think like in every country, written communication um, is at the end what everybody is gonna go back to and say, okay, this is what we, what we have talked about and this is what we have confirmed. And the US is all the importance of the law and everybody really also taking that it's part of everybody's culture, really the, the respect for the law. And we're gonna talk about, especially of course, in terms of like buying, negotiating the con legal considerations of, for the US market, which are very complex and specific. So we wanna touch on that later a little bit more in detail. Mudita is gonna give insights here. 
For a couple of new characteristics, um, I'm just going to go really briefly over um, the topics gender equality, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, and inclusivity. I have a separate slide for that, um, so I'm going to jump over it for now and move into the next slide here. And um, again, feel free to jump in with any questions. Um, I really like this graphic. If you look at it, what you have on the, you see the arrows in the lower part of this graphic. You have on the left side, the lower context, on the right side, the higher context. Basically what this graphic tells us is the, um, the positioning of each country or like an estimate of how we communicate. And what you can see on the right side, you see Asian, Asia and Japan on um, the right side of being extremely high context communica communicators, which means the communication is way more complex because not everything is said direct as in the US or in maybe you see Switzerland on the other side and Germany where you come straight to the point, especially negotiations, you're gonna say, okay, these are my, my terms, this is what I wanna achieve, these are my objectives. In Asia, the communication starts way different. And you see also then um, Arabic countries, uh, Southern European countries and he, on the right side more. And going to Peter's point here, if you look at Europe, you have Switzerland and Germany full on on the left in communication while you have uh, Southern Europe on the right side. So that's not in the US, you wouldn't have that. So if you look in the middle, there's um, Australia, you have also um, like some of other European countries who are in the middle and on the left side, on the lower context in the middle, you have America. So you see here that the communication in the US is definitely like easier to understand in many ways because it is direct and also agile if you can switch to the other, the next slide for me. Um, it is straightforward and linear. So if, if somebody is telling you something, you can count on that's what they mean. You do not have to interpret. In a higher context uh, communication, you would maybe need to interpret into what they've said, how they've said it, what it really means. Also really important, low context communication is always um, disagreements are depersonalized. There's a lot of when you sit in negotiations, you communicate that it is okay to disagree and to argue, and but it will be um, depersonalized and not taken into the private conversation. Maybe for lunch, everybody's going to sit there again and be like, oh, hey, how was your day? How was your weekend? And be very casual and nice about it. Conflicts in communication do not have to be resolved immediately, which means they can be taken to the next round of ne negotiations, communications, and also very important solutions really tend to be rationally based. Privacy valued, you might like, I think a lot of countries are similar. People don't want to be too close. They like their space when they talk. They don't want somebody stand too close. Sometimes um, that also comes with like, touching some, some, I know I lived in Austria for a long time. There's, and I think Switzerland is similar. Maybe Yasmin knows better. It's always like getting kissed on the, on the cheeks and being hugged and it's kind of, it's a little bit closer. So in the US in general, privacy and personal space are highly valued and pro the kissing and hugging is only done at a, at a later stage when you know your business partners uh, better or it won't be done at all. Um, verbal messages are very explicit and direct and speed is valued. We're going to talk about that also a little bit more and efficiency is really important for low context cultures. Be getting things done as quick as possible. Okay, so and I'm going to move into um, really important societal changes, or let's call them movements right now in the, in the US. And I wouldn't say it's only uh, in the US. It's definitely globally, worldwide. You see here the equality, Black Lives Matter, inclusivity, and diversity in Me Too. 
The question is, how does that affect doing business? Why is this so important to take into consideration and have like a brief overview of, of what it means here in the US and right now? If we look at equality, you will, and most of you have been to magic, for example, if you envision how magic looks, you mostly will need female buyers. So in the US, there's definitely a move for equality already the last like quite a quite a long time so you will find a lot of women in leading positions in director positions vice president roles and it's it's only increasing um there's the fight for like equal pay and like really building an eye-to-eye -eye society between men and women which is really important what does that mean for for us in being negotiating in the business means that women expect to be treated eye, eye to eye. They want to be treated the same than a man in a negotiation. And um, that, that is really important. Um, also, maybe a couple of uh, notes what the very specific to the United States is women go back to work after having children really quickly. Society set up that after Many times, even four to six weeks, some, some women will start working right away. And it, it is very like it's acceptable and also supported by the economy and by companies. Moving into the, the next part, Black Lives Matter. All of you have been following the news. You have seen what has been happening, especially also in addition to the to the COVID crisis. There have been protests in the US. The, what is the Black Lives Matter movement? Maybe just as a quick definition, it's decentralized. It's a decentralized political and social movement advocating for nonviolent um, pro protest, and it is against police brutality. But also, um, it is against racially motivated violence, and which means right now you can see a lot big shifts and it was already visible the last years but it's more even from this year on um, in working against systemic racism in the united states means really also working towards equality and not differentiating between races okay so moving into the last two ones um and inclusivity and diversity i think what's really um just also a, a reminder what what does it mean and why is it so business for doing business especially in the apparel industry there's a lot of about talk about beauty ideal standards we are going a little bit away from that you see if we you talk to generation z or millennials um there's a really the importance of being inclusive means all also all shapes all body sizes accepting beauty be um, as is and there's no like really standard if what's your skin color what's your weight what's your hair color all of that is reflected with especially apparel and beauty brands in their marketing means if we look at catalogs and all of you creating website materials with um, photography think of what are your models? Are they diverse enough? Do you show different nationalities? Do you show different sizes and shapes? Um, this is a really big in the, especially the industry we are all in. So really important to keep in mind, especially in the US, extremely important right now. And the last one, uh, the Me Too movement, not only in the US, it definitely, it started with um, a couple of like really, uh, publicity and uh, public cases here with uh, celebrities, but it, it swapped into all other countries. The Me Too movement is, the definition is also so, social movement against sexual abuse and sexual harassment, which means right now a lot of people are very outspoken. And the reason um, we wanted to mention this is uh, if you think of like business culture 10 years back, five years back, many times there are those little comments. There's these little, like also you think you're making a joke and, and sometimes it's misunderstood. And maybe people who are like working in the team will, will misunderstand and feel um, also that they, they are mistreated in a way. So there is a really high sensitivity in communication in also, and that means not only communication, but also how we act, how every move 
if you how you work with women specifically, but also other men. So the Me Too movement also really important to just consider doing business um, in the United States and this awareness in the country right now for that. Okay, and I'm gonna um, hand to Jill. Thank you for uh, moving the slides for me. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's my pleasure, Anne. Yes, so um, I'm going to speak about communication and sort of creating those types of dialogues between yourself and your potential customers and how to build those relationships as well. So the first thing I want to talk about, we have a phrase here called the elevator pitch. And I don't know what the corresponding phrase would be internationally, but if you think about it, it's you get into an elevator with somebody and you have about 30 seconds to talk to that person and make a connection with that person or tell that person about yourself or your company. So what I'm recommending is that to, to be prepared to be in a situation where you're able to pitch your company, you're able to pitch your services to anyone at any time. Um, for me, I am a big proponent. I'm not going to cut over, but I'm a big proponent of having business cards with me at all times. Um, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, and no matter what occasion it is, I always have business cards with me because I never know who I'm going to meet. And I make that same recommendation to anybody else as well. Um, just to be able to have a conversation with somebody, whether it's casual or, or business, to be able to exchange information with them, to be able to communicate about yourself and also to actively listen about somebody else as well. So it's very important to be able to speak about yourself, be concise, which I'm not being right now, and uh, talk about your services and your products quickly and efficiently. Also, when you're attending trade shows um, or any type of professional event, I would recommend that you have promotional materials. I know Francis will be speaking about websites and the importance of the websites, and I have a little bit of note as well on that, but promotional materials are very important to be able to hand out to anybody who, who you're speaking with, who you want to make a connection with, any potential customers, to be able to, to talk about your services, but also to be able to show the types of products that you make. So if you specialize in a particular, um, if you specialize in a particular type of garment, if you make men's shirts, if you're making women's dresses, if you're making intimate apparel or socks, you should definitely have um, material with you in order to be able to show the quality of your work and to be able to give somebody something that they can take away. I know that when we go to trade shows, one of the things that they do at Magic and a lot of the other trade shows, the first thing you do when you register is that they'll give you your badge. And a lot of times they'll have a free tote bag that you can take with you that you can fill up with all of the material that you're getting. And also all the material that you might want to be giving to other people. So I recommend taking advantage of that, having content and, and making it look professional. Because when you think about it, it is your calling card to a company. They might not remember your name. They might not remember your face. But what they do have is this piece of promotional material about your company and about your products. And that's what's going to ring a bell for them. And that's what's going to help with them to make a connection with you in the future. May I add one thing on that? Um, yes, of course. Um, if you're looking at the catalogs that you've got, as a, we've got examples there. What I would really like to clearly show is the jackets, the, the way they are presented is mostly on a white background. So that's one of the things that I would like to point out. Your marketing material, giving it the light for it to be seen. And instead of having any black or dark backgrounds, the, even the light gray, you can still see, but you can see it's also sucking a little. So I just want to point that out, being I'm more on the artistic side than on the academic side. And, and I'm the technolo technology geek here, so it, it all looks good to me. <laughs> okay, so, and, and your website. So Francis will speak a little bit more about that um, coming up, but think of your website also as that elevator pitch. If you're not meeting somebody directly in an elevator or in a restaurant or at a trade show or any, any place directly these days, unfortunately, 
you don't have that opportunity to make a connection with the person directly. But so your website really does need to speak for you. It needs to speak about your company. It needs to speak about the products. It needs to tell your potential customers what they want to know. And, and really it's that first page that they're going to that is either going to grab their attention or they're just going to flip away from that and find another website that, that is a bit more interesting to them. So I believe this is somebody else's slide, marketing through your website. Francis, is this your slide? Yes. Um, as we know that uh, during the last few months during this pandemic, it's been catastrophic to most people and businesses. And so it's most of it's going on. It, it, it was all happening before this virus. And what's gone on now over the last few months is just accelerated this, uh, this, this inevitability about businesses going more and more online. And we're seeing as, as we see here in America and in Europe, more and more of the big stores are closing the doors. Um, Neiman Marcus, there's so many different stores, that, nameless, that uh, are actually closing. So what's happening? People are going online. So that means, you, it, it, you know, unless you're Walmart, you're buying at Target or Walmart, they're still surviving. And I think the reason they're doing, they are, is because they also sell, sell food. So, you know, what is it that you can show immediately when you're going to when visitors go to your website and it's going to be the change in um, I know a lot of you are manufacturing and you're looking for big orders but you, you're going to have to think about more on demand and thinking about selling through the websites and so we'll get more into on-demand manufacturing later on my screen's gone dead oh dear gosh what is going on oh, no we can see it here we can see it okay. here friend Yes, Mine's gone the... black. Mine's just gone black. This happened before. I'm so sorry. So um, I'm talking blindly about websites, but I hope it comes back up. I'm not sure why this has happened. Um, so websites are really crucial. That is your window. It's like looking at a store window, thinking of when people go there, what are they looking at? And um, I'm going through this myself. My website also has to go through a total upgrade. I had a big meeting yesterday with my developer and what needs to be done. Um, it's, it's crucial that your calling card or your 30 second elevator pitch is clearly defined on the website. So review your website. And I know we've been, Anne and I have been talking to a number of you about the websites and remembering this is telling an immediate story. What is it you're doing? Are you selling clothing or are you selling a building? Are you selling uh, your your directors? You are selling clothing. So please, let's see these websites telling the story of what type of products that you are selling. And that will give you a, a, a possible link to having people come to your website and follow through, click through, get more information. Have a, a story there available also about your businesses. Maybe have a, um, a button on the top somewhere. Uh, but your immediate viewer who comes to the website will want to see what it is you do. So your product. Your product is your elevator pitch. And so please make sure that you have some story there. We will be talking later on a bit more about sustainability, but that's another thing that should be marketed on your website. How sustainable is your company, whether it's choosing sustainable threads to sew or giving away bits of fabrics, we'll get more into that. But anyway, I wanted to talk to you about the website, make sure it's clearly to navigate, people understand what you're doing. My screen, I'm so sorry, is still black, I'm not sure why. Um, can you see me at all or not? Yes, we can see you, we can hear you and the screen is up. So you were talking about uh, B2B, you were talking about e-commerce. Uh, your next point is an implementing an effective email strategy. Yes. Okay. So I don't know about you, but every time I go to trade shows, I collect business cards, the business cards that Jill was talking about that are being handed out. Um, and I have a, an active database of around 14,000 people. And so how do you, how do you collect your database? You can also collect your database through people visiting your website. Um, you can have a immediate pop-up so please leave us your email so we can connect with you later on uh, these are the things that 
as we go forward, this is a way of advertising what you do. So email, um, emailing through um, some kind of service. Uh, I'm sure there are di different types of service depending on how much data you have to email blast. Um, and then of course, blogs, social media. How are you doing that? This is, I know it's, it's more work on everybody's plate, but you can hire people to help you with your social media. I have a, a young fashion student who's helping me and she's, she's brilliant. So, you know, you can, you just need to figure it out. Who is in charge of what? And this goes to probably your marketing plan as well. Having someone who's going to be in charge of your website, in charge of your marketing, in charge of your social media. This is your business card and this will help you get your own brand recognition. So I'm not sure what else is on that slide, Jill. I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, you, you did it perfectly, Francis. It's like you've done this presentation before. <laughs> well, can I, uh, uh, can I jump in for a second? Sure. Of course. Uh, I, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, when you have your website, you have to, um, I know the web developers are there, but they don't know what you want to show. Uh, I think the executives uh, or, or the company uh, leadership, you have to make sure that you tell the developer what you need to uh, tell the uh, buyers. You have to think like a buyer and you have to, you have to wear buyer's shoes and then you have to um, see what buyers want, want to know. And then you, you come up with the information what the buyer wants to know. It's not that buyer wants to, you know, that what you want to tell the world, but you want to make sure the information is there, what buyer wants to know. Just, just a quick tip. I think also I would add to that, that the buyers want to see um, merchandise goods. So how do these pieces that you are selling uh, relate? So if you're doing ladies' pajamas, putting them up there and merchandising them, maybe you're doing men's pajamas. So putting them, having some kind of a merchandise look, because basically I say this, it's a broken record, but um, it's about merchandising these days and showing what it is and how people can put pieces together rather than particularly trends. So there are certain trends that are more subtle, but having a merchandised look about your website is very important and a merchandise look about your products as well and people are very impatient they want to find the information within the first five seconds just imagine you go to a website you're trying to find the price or a color of something and you cannot find it you are you're like frustrated and you will be switching another website very quickly so think you are the consumer and people are very very impatient because of the power of the web technology today and how fast that is. It certainly is. Okay, I'm moving forward. So communication. And I think one of the biggest things today is we have so many ways, so many different forms of communication. We can text, we can WeChat, we can WhatsApp, we can iMessage, we can um, message on things like Cisco Jabber on the computer, we can leave a voicemail, we can leave um, an email. And I think that the challenge is being consistent with that communication. I can only speak for US companies because most US companies want communication by email. It's okay to reach out to somebody with a phone call, but it is not okay to try to conduct business via text or WeChat or, um, oh, sorry. It, 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 it's not okay to try to conduct business informally over a, a chat um, application on the phone, primarily because we need to keep a record of that conversation. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about a purchase order, you're talking about work in process, or if you're talking about potential delivery dates or any of those things, um, I, Keeping that to email, it makes it much easier to be able to keep that string of information together for your customers. It's not to say that it's not okay to pick up the phone to call. Um, I think a lot of people do like to speak directly to a customer or a customer likes to speak directly to a vendor or a factory, but um, as well as video conference like we're doing now. 
but the main form of communication definitely needs to be via email. We're not as sophisticated in the US in terms of all of the technology we're using. And there's so many different options that while well, you might have one preferred method to communicate, um, we may have multiple different methods that we're communicating to different, different regions, different companies. And so by keeping things to email, it does make it professional and it does make it consistent. And back to Anne's point earlier, um, keeping, keeping that, the content of the email professional, keeping it to um, <clears throat> complete words, not three letter acronyms or you know, abbreviations makes it very easy to explain exactly what it is you're trying to convey and also for the person reading the email to understand exactly what it is you're trying to tell them and vice versa. So my recommendation is always to keep it to email. And with that, um, being respectful. So respect is a two-way street. If, if you're not responding to emails on your weekend, just you need to let your customers know because we have different weekend days um, in, in the US than we do in most of the Arabic countries and in the Middle East. So while we have Saturday and Sunday as our weekend, you have Friday and Saturday as your weekend. So we do have that overlap of days where we might not be working, you might not be working, and there can be a lag in communication. So, so long as your customers or your potential customers are aware of that, um, typically that shouldn't be an issue. If you have somebody that's completely impatient and is expecting a response right away, um, all day, every day, 24 hours a day, you might possibly want to rethink whether or not that is the good business relationship for you. So until you've established um, a, a really solid working relationship with your customers, you do want to keep the communication more formal and you do want to keep it more respectful. So nicknames, abbreviations, things like that, you know, little jokes that, that you might be developing with that customer or with some of, of your contacts there are probably better left off of email until you have built that relationship with them and you do feel comfortable that you can joke back and forth, so on. So for, for us, well, in, in the US we are, there are many polyglots, many of us do speak more than one language. It does help when you're conversing in a group to keep the conversation to English. Um, it's, it's more professional. Unless you have a colleague in the room that's a non-English speaker and you do want to convey what's going on to them. Um, typically it's just, it's most respectful to keep, keep the conversation to the common language. Um, if, if you have a way that you want people to address you, so as Anne was saying, we are very informal here. Um, Peter and Muditha are both professors. They both have doctorates. And so typically we might call them Dr. Kilda or Dr. Sinanayaka. Um, but in, in our conversations here, we call them Muditha and we call them Peter. Um, if you have a certain way that you would want yourself to be addressed, whether it's a professor or a doctor or sir or however it is, and then just let your customer know. Um, we do have a little bit of over familiarity when we call people by their first name right off the bat. And if that's not something you're comfortable with, then let somebody know. Also, same with if you have religious or personal restrictions, make sure your customers are aware of it. As Anne was saying, in some European countries, people very informally will hug or kiss each other on the cheek. And in other customs and religions, that's really not acceptable at all. So, so long as people are aware of it, I think it's, it's okay to communicate that. Um, people don't know what they don't know. And most people aren't offended if you do have a particular, um, a particular way that you want to be addressed or a particular way that you don't want to be touched or interact with other people. Can, can I just jump in a second, Jill? Um, having come from England to the United States about um, a little over 20 years ago, I was very surprised the first time I got hugged in, in, in England. You would only ever, in, in business, you would only ever do a handshake and that's it. You would never think of touching anybody. And, um, in, in, and, and I would say in the United States, guys definitely don't hug each other. 
and um, I never go to hug somebody, but usually I find uh, that if I'm dealing uh, with a colleague who's a woman, that sometimes it, um, they will give you a hug at the end of the meeting. Um, but I, but as, as a guy, I never initiate anything um, and never have, but especially in, in the climate we are now, um, it's, it's respectful that what everybody would understand is a handshake. Handshake or with what's going on with COVID, you might have to do an elbow bump, a or, fist bump. Fist bump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or 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 just you know wave or or give a peace sign or you know oh I'm sorry I'm doing my Star Trek sign there. My apologies, I am a geek. Peace sign, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> so as far as communication, getting back to that. With meetings and appointments, um, so it, it it is important to be able to have that professional dialogue back and forth with your customers, and it's important to have a single reliable platform. So whatever it is that you choose, and and with something like today's meeting, where I think we're using Zoom technology, um, there's so many other technologies that are similar that have the same functions. So I don't think it you necessarily need to be consistent with all of your customers, so long as you have one application that works for you and also one application that they're using that works for them. It's easy enough to download the link to the meeting. It'll automatically um, download a small program into your computer. It will connect to the website and you will be able to communicate back and forth on a video conference with whatever application you're using. But you do wanna make sure that it is, that it is reliable that you do have a reliable internet connection. Um, I, I'm very happy that my internet connection is working today. So I apologize if I suddenly drop out, we're having some problems in my area with that. Um, but it's, it's important to have those types of tools to be able to connect it. Also, um, what you wanna do with those tools is that it should create a link to a meeting. Um, I don't know how many of you when you get these meeting appointments, actually go to the link that it has that says add to your calendar. But if you aren't already doing that, I highly recommend adding these things to your calendar. So it will automatically send you reminders before the meeting and it will help you with being on time to, to get to that meeting. And that brings me to calendars. So when using a calendar, if you are trying to coordinate content, um, conversations or meetings with your suppliers, with your customers, with other vendors, or with other factories that you might be doing business with, it can be very helpful to have a public calendar. It's not to say that you're going to publish your private calendar with your personal appointments on it to the world for them to be able to see. But many companies do have what they call a public calendar or public scheduling tools, which would allow companies, customers, whoever it is to be able to see what your level of availability is. And they can use that to schedule meetings, especially when we're working across these different time zones where it may not be so easy for somebody to connect with you during a business day. If they can see when your calendar is available, they would know to be able to make an appointment with you in a time frame that would work for both, of, for both you and, and the person you're trying to connect with. Um, I'm going to say this twice. So be on time for all meetings, whether, you're, whether you schedule it or the customer does. Um, with, in the US, we do think of time as money. And so if we're wasting time, we feel like we're wasting money. And for the most part, I can say that most companies do start their meetings on time, maybe a minute or two after if we're trying to get the connectivity working. Um, so people, when, when people are showing up late for a meeting, it, some people can take that as a sign of disrespect, meaning my time isn't as valuable as your time. So showing up late means that the, the relationship that we have is, is not valuable to you. And one other thing about calendars. So when somebody does send a meeting request to you, they want to set up a meeting, they want to set up a Zoom conversation, they want to set up a phone call, the proper etiquette there would be to respond promptly if, if you're able. Now, if they're sending it at midnight your time and you're asleep, then obviously there is a you know, reason to wait till the morning to respond to that. 
that a lot of times if a customer doesn't get a response to that meeting request, typically they're going to schedule something else in that place. So it's important to do that um, to be able to respond quickly. And there are tools that you can use with your email if this is something that you would want to do where you can, can send a note on your email reply. So if somebody sends you an email, you can send back an automatic reply saying, um, I'm not available from these working hours. I will respond to you as soon as possible. And so people will understand that you are not going to respond until you're back to your computer. And one more time, uh, being on time for all meetings. Americans take the phrase time is money very seriously. So when we feel like we're wasting time, we feel like we're wasting money. So that I'm going to, oh, sorry, got one more. Um, so Anne did touch on a lot of these topics earlier in, in the presentation, but there are certain topics of conversation as a rule that are not really comfortable to talk about. And I think in, in various societies, we have various levels of familiarity with people, but in general, discussing politics, uh, discussing sexual orientation or gender identification or asking people about religion is not typically conversation that you would want to start with as you're trying to build relationships with people. And rule of thumb would be is when in doubt, it's safest to wait to ask personal questions about people, about their family and whatnot until somebody asks those questions to you first. All right, Peter, I'm gonna hand this back over to you. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on stop sharing if you wanna pull up the quick review slide. Sure, so. Um, um, Oh, so let's see. I can continue sharing if you'd like. It's no, it's 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 okay. I think I think this is is mine. Can everybody see? I need to scroll down now to the right place. Since yes, it's slide number twenty, I believe. Oh, there you go. Yes, this one. Slide number twenty, and if you want to expand your screen to there, you go. That's. That should do it. Hold on. Yeah. There, that's perfect. So, uh, whose is this slide? Maybe um, there's some questions at this point. We've been we've been going for about 50, 45 to fifty minutes. I wonder if anybody has any questions they want to pose at this point. Uh, well, uh, Peter, I don't, I, I don't see questions in the question and answer uh, section. So, if okay. anyone wants to to ask a question, maybe you can raise your hand or or write it down in the Q and A section, so we can answer to uh, to it now. Okay. Well, let me let me let me continue whilst. Um, um, we, we get some, some questions. So, so for a quick review, if your business website is not getting the, uh, the traffic that you expect, the number of eyeballs looking at it, then review your strategies, your potential customers, your advertising, your personal presentation, your business offerings, your business goals, and the social media that you are, are using. And... Um, <clears throat> So questions to ask yourself. So tell, so can you tell about your organization in 30 seconds or less? Um, or for your website, a short paragraph. So remember that people don't like to, at least uh, Americans, don't like to do a lot of reading. Short and concise messages that convey exactly what you want somebody to know about your company um, are really valuable. So how would you describe your business to someone that knows nothing about it or you? Are there any obstacles or uh, are there any, anything that you need to do to navigate them? Um, um, so understand what obstacles that a prospective client faces 
It'll not only help you address the obstacle, but it will also help you navigate it as you begin working with that potential client. Um, <clears throat> and think about what is it your business can do that no one else can? Uh, what makes you different? Um, the Americans have uh, something they call, <clears throat> I mean, this is actually from a famous um, marketing person from the 1960s, the unique selling proposition. What is your company's unique selling proposition? What is it that's unique that you can do that's different to everybody else in your view? So um, US companies will really understand a unique selling proposition. So what, what can you do that will make you stand out? What words, what stories, what images, what videos, what interviews um, or presentations? So. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, I, they may also not... want to think about what kind of equipment they can offer. Do they do printing on demand? You know, having an, an understanding of what, as you said, Peter, makes them stand out. And we all, you know, when you start a business, you start a business because you feel there is a need for this type of business. So what sets you apart from somebody else? So having this on your you know, not making it too crowded, but I, I think it's important that they need to understand what it is that you can offer that people can get clearly, whether we, we talked about the different types of machine or you're able to do smaller quantities. What is it you do that, that will, will make you stand, stand apart um, to make you memorable? And can I jump in for a second? Sure. Yeah, so also I think the technology has provided us a lot of opportunity to do that very quickly. So um, small video clips, three second video clips about your facility, what you do. Uh, I mean, small things like, I can remember when I was working in the industry, things like you provide breakfast to your uh, employees. It takes a long way when, you, uh, when some buyers, uh, how they think, right? You provide them aprons to wear, you have a, a uh, health center with a doctor and a nurse in house, things like that. Uh, even some of them may be a compliance requirement for some buyers, uh, big buyers, but it can take a long way. So you can do that very quickly. I think also you need to sort of have, do you have the right certificates if you want to sell to the US market? Do you have certificates in place the got certificate, the RAP certificate, what kind of certifications you have, it's good to have them maybe along the side so people can see that you have got the certificates to uh, export to America. And, and also, uh, like as Francis said, some like, for example, Nike, Nike certify your lab, right? They do a lot of, you know, work, they, you're testing, for example, lab dips. So it's, it's good to put that on your website because it gives a, um, a, a credibility of what your business is all about. Even if it does not need to be Nike, it can be a small company that you're working with who has given you that certification of your lab, for example. Thanks, Meditha. That makes a point I'm going to make in a slide, uh, one okay. or two slides along called social proof. Um, validation from external parties about your business. And maybe, sorry, I know we jumped in a lot. Just one comment for, for all the attendees. We're going to have a webinar on how to build your brand because today we're touching on all these really important topics for you, how to really set you up for be, having a competitive advantage. We talked about USP um, website. And social media, we're touching on like certificates. So in our next webinar, uh, we definitely, we're going to spend the whole webinar on really building your brand. We're going to have an additional sustainability part in that. So just for all of you who are like, oh, I want to hear more. Um, it's going to come next uh, in the next webinar on, on these topics, because today it's just very top line. OK, thanks, everybody. So, so once you've identified what it is that makes your prospect unique, you need to identify how best to portray your message. Um, and identifying content is crucial for any success, no matter what the client does. 
and um, you will now know whether you need to focus on content creation, um, like SEO friendly uh, blog writing. Um, maybe somebody can tell me what SEO is. Search engine optimization. Search engine optimization. Yes, go. you were using three letter acronyms, Peter, which we, we said we were not going to be using today. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I didn't write these few slides. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, uh, you know, it, it is having maybe put po posting short things on whether it's Instagram, Facebook, or any of the other sort of social media places, having this constant, I, I mean, it, it can be exhausting, and it sort of takes away from what you're doing, but it's part of your, your own branding as well, um, which we will definitely talk about more later on. Okay, well, let's, let's move along. So the next few slides, in fact, uh, are, are ones I put together, which are about negotiating with US companies and, and understanding cultural aspects. Um, so we've, we've, we've said um, these things already. The US is large and it's, it is very diverse. Um, and one of the things that surprised me when I came to live in the United States was how relatively inward looking it is. But it's inward looking because it is already large and diverse. Um, so many Americans don't pay a lot of attention to world affairs and to foreign um, cultures. Um, so um, they don't have a lot of cultural um, knowledge. They don't have a great deal of um, cultural empathy necessarily, but don't confuse this with being arrogant or with being racist. It's just a lack of um, just a lack of knowledge. So American culture, as we've, we've already said, places value on getting things done. Um, so any negotiation process with an American company is likely to be very structured and follow a um, schedule that um, that includes milestones. And um, in negotiations, um, the, the focus of US businesses is on results, outcomes rather than relationships. And, um, and it's not that relationships aren't important, um, but um, um, the focus is very much on um, let's have a result. Um, and um, Americans do look to build trust, um, but trust is often about um, uh, process and co contractual terms and uh, and the force of law that um, Manitha is going to talk about um, uh, later. So um, the communication culture in the United States is very direct. So um, so Anne talked about um, low and high context, and and the U.S. is a relatively low context. Communicator, it's really about um, um, what is said verbally. There's a high value on speaking the truth. Um, they're not likely to expect you to understand their feelings. Um, they will express themselves. They expect you to understand what they say. Um, the, the communication culture of, in the US can be perceived as, as rude and aggressive because of the directness and because of the tempo by which Americans will often conduct things. Um, communications which are non-verbal non may confuse US negotiators, um, but eye contact is an important indication of sincerity. Um, so it's important to make eye contact, but of course, not to be staring at somebody, you'll unnerve them. But, um, but lack of eye contact that seems like you're being evasive, you've got something to hide. So making eye contact is important. So the important thing is communicate verbally and say what you think. Americans will understand that and they will respond to it. So um, Americans see negotiating as a back and forth process um, in which facts questions and ideas are exchanged and to which they move towards a shared understanding. And shared understanding is a very important term in, in American business. Um, it's essentially a legal term. So um, 
in negotiations, the, the desired outcome is a shared understanding and a successful contract. So expect Americans to follow a structured and rigid approach to negotiating. Time um, is a critical aspect, as we've already discussed. So don't overtly disrupt the flow and pace of negotiations by creating diversions or giving vague answers. Don't feel rushed into doing something. So if you need more time to think about something, then express that. We really need more. We need some time to think about that. So thank you for sharing this, but we need time to think about this. So let us um, break to meet and we'll come back to you. That they will understand. But don't do um, kind of vague delays or things that are disrupted because that will only cause irritation. Business agreements and outcomes, so take precedence over personal feelings. Don't take offense from aspects of US negotiating culture that is different. Um, 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 as, as I said, it's really about business. It's not about um, uh, personal. And um, on the right-hand side, I put in a graphic that um, negotiating process with the US companies will typically follow these kind of, this um, um, kind of structure. Initial meetings where you share information and establish facts, and then, then a break to evaluate this information, um, assess each other's positions, develop objectives, and establish the negotiating agenda. And then a series, a meeting or a series of meetings to narrow differences that will lead to an agreement and conclusion of the negotiations. So um, it's a very structured process. So pre-negotiation planning is critical. So in pre-negotiation planning, um, establish your goal. Um, so you really have to spend a lot of time um, determining what is it you want to achieve uh, with potential clients? What is your goal? Um, what are the longer term strategic objectives you want from this negotiation? And then the next thing is analyze and understand your counterparts' um, needs. Do research on their company. So most US companies have websites that provide a lot of information about their business. It's really worth going to their websites and studying them carefully. There's kind of too much information there. If it's a public company, it will publish an annual report with a lot of detail about its business. Companies will often talk about their brands and who they're aimed at. They'll talk about what their values are, their values to their to consumers, their values to their own workforce and, um, and all of their interested publics. So, um, so go and research the company, check out their website. It's really worth investing significant time um, um, there because you'll find a lot of the information that will help you understand their business, what they do, how they do it, um, what is their value offering? And, and, and as a company, what are their core values? So that might tell you that instead of just um, entering negotiations through the doorway of price, you could actually emphasize with this company that you can provide quality and you can provide service. And um, so, so learning about the company will help you find uh, ways to approach a negotiation. Whoops. Sorry, my, I have a Bluetooth mouse that has its own mind. Um, so then identify all facts and issues relevant to the negotiation. Um, so facts, you need to know about the company, your own company. So um, remember that you just don't want to understand your um, client's company, but you overtly need to understand what it is yourself. You establish your overall goal, but what are your very specific objectives um, 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 to, um, uh, that you want to pursue? Um, and so identify what are the critical issues on which the negotiation is going to be based. 
So these could be price, they can be lead time, they can be finance terms, they could be compliance, and of course, cancellation. And it can be all of these things. And um, of course, um, in 2020, a lot of Asian suppliers to American retailers um, only just discovered the cancellation clauses in their contracts. So um, it's very important to understand all aspects. Um, and, and again, um, companies will actually have a lot of information on their website, how they work with their customers, how they expect them to be. And you can often get this information in advance specifically for bigger companies. So Jim, develop I jump in that. Yes. Um, I just would say, if you're dealing with any big box co companies, then they can be absolutely ruthless. We talked about on time, being on time to meetings. On time delivery is a huge issue. So any excuse that for you not delivering on this particular window of time, they will cancel it particularly now when the businesses are so bad, any excuse to cancel um, because you're late will be crucial to you. So make sure if you're given a window by, a, a, by an order, make sure that that order is shipped on time. Otherwise you'll be in jeopardy of having uh, chargebacks or canceled orders. And believe me, those chargebacks, you don't want to deal with them. So again, making sure, and they, they are, they have, uh, profit making departments on making money for their own business by charging back. So please make sure if you're expected to deliver on time, that you deliver on time, make sure that you're shipping the tops and the bottoms together, make sure that you're doing the order. They give you a huge manual. So it's important that you look through that and know what their expectations are so that you can deliver um, on time. And again, and I think this is something we, um, we need to also stress is business is built on on relationships you know you you come through you perform that relationship can move forward so i think that's probably the same wherever you are but i think that's the business practices in america are they can be incredibly brutal but um again making sure that you're on time with um with with your orders or if there's any problems let them know discuss it with them sorry peter no, thanks, thanks, Francis. That was great. And it allowed me to get a sip of tea. Um, so um, develop your specific objectives and priorities for the outcome. What exactly do you want to achieve? And establish your position on each issue. What is your minimum? What is your the target you hope to achieve? And what could be your realistic maximum where you go home with a big smile on your face? Um, and it may seem obvious, but most people do walk into negotiations without having thought through exactly what they want to walk away with. So it really takes a lot of thinking. Um, so make sure that you have laid out your specific objectives your priorities and you, what is your position on each of the potential negotiating issues. And then develop your negotiating tactics. Um, approaches that can help you achieve the desired income. Um, and we'll talk about tactic, tactics in the, some tactics in the next slide. And train your team. Um, so unless you're negotiating on yourself, and I would say probably it's always good to have more than one person there. It's good to approach these as a team. Um, it's, it's, fairly, it's going to be fairly complex. You want multiple people there so you're not just relying on one person. Um, so train your team, brief them thoroughly, make sure that everybody is reading from the same script. And, and a thing to do is practice the negotiation to highlight possible ploys and issues raised by your counterparts. Um, because things come up, actually practicing is a really, really good um, um, thing to do. So here's some negotiating tactics. So, um, and I'm not saying these are all things you should do. They're, they're just tactics that you can find that happen in negotiations. And I'm sure that you've used a whole bunch of these yourselves and, uh, and maybe some more besides. Um, but uh, but uh, building a rapport with your counterparts is an important part. We said that um, US companies 
um, really don't work on the basis of relationships. Um, but of course, um, uh, building a rapport is important in business. Um, yes, US companies are very much focused on terms and conditions and, um, and outcomes. But of course, we all like, we all prefer to work with people that we get on with. And uh, when you first meet, building that rapport um, so you get on with each other, this will help grease the wheels of the negotiating process. Um, showing reciprocation is, is about giving back after receiving something. So if they give you a concession, you can maybe share a concession with them. I'm not saying you have to do this, it's just a tactic. Um, so providing social proof. So um, Meditha mentioned earlier about um, uh, providing proof about, oh, some company uses your facilities. So if you have a certification, ISO 9002, um, Urquitex or Ecotex um, certification, or there was some um, article in um, the, the National Egyptian newspaper about how wonderful your business is and how wonderful you treat your employees. This is social proof. Um, this is good to include in, in your publicity as, as um, I think um, um, Francis or um, uh, um, Jill was saying, having this on your website is, 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 is good. It, it provides um, evidence that you're a company to work with. Um, of course, another thing in, in negotiations is, is using sources of negotiating power. And um, those sources of power could typically be knowledge or information. Um, so that uh, you may have knowledge or information that gives you an edge or your client may have knowledge or information and reward power, the, the ability to reward somebody, for instance, with a big contract. Of course, when dealing with um, large US buyers, the power tends to be stacked in their favor. They are, they are big fairly sophisticated companies. Um, they have the reward power in that they can give you a big contract, they can give you continuity. Um, so it's, it's good to be aware of, of um, how power is used, whether you're able to wield any or whether it's being wielded on you. But use of power is, of course, an important part of um, negotiating. But as I'll come to at the end, an important outcome for negotiations is actually to try and develop a win-win strategy where power actually is not a big issue. It's really about um, a win-win for both sides. And then planned concessions um, are another tactic, which is where um, you, again, and, and this can, should be something part of planning, um, is um, moving away from your initial negotiating position towards the other parties. So maybe when you start, you, um, you want a lead time of three months, but after talking with the retailer, okay, you give them a concession and you give them a lead time of two months. So um, pl planned concessions. Concessions are, are necessary to, to avoid impasses um, where you kind of um, um, say, no, that's it, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything. This is inflexibility and inflexibility will lead to a, a deadlock, you won't be able to move. And, and small concessions um, signal future inflexibility. So maybe um, um, you, you wanted a unit price of $10 and um, you were able to come down with the first concession to $8, but, but now really having come down to $8, you're really not gonna be able to go much further. So when, if you get, keep getting pressured on price, and you say, well, I could do 795, then you're signaling that you really don't have much further to go, that you're really getting to the end of your ability to give concessions in on that particular issue. And then there's, there's negotiating uh, gambits, uh, things like bluffing. Um, so we have another offer on the table. We have another client who's, who's, who's waiting to work with us. And, um, and then scarcity, like uh, buy it now while stocks last, or um, we need to, if we can seal the contract now, we can get it at, we can seal it before the price increase comes into effect. 
Um, so these are scarcity tactics. Uh, reticence is about seeming unworried about whether you can reach a deal or not. Um, it's, well, we, you know, we're here because we'd like to reach a deal, but we're not too worried about this. It'd be nice if we can have a deal with you, but we're not too worried. Reticence means you're not, you're not desperate. You're, it's not critical. And, and, and again, it's, it's a gambit. It's a little, it's a kind of bluffing. Uh, silence. Um, so, um, um, uh, not responding to something they've said. Um, a high ball is um, taking a tough opening position. You know, we want $20 um, per unit um, when actually your target is maybe $12 a unit. And uh, low ball is, is the opposite. It's um, offering a very low price to ensure that a deal is, is reached. And then um, a trial balloon is, is a what if. What if we did this? Uh, what would you be able to do? Um, and um, and then best and final offer, uh, which indicates that basically you're really at the end point of where you're able to go. This is our best and final offer. So you, you've reached the limit of your ability to negotiate. So this is the best and final offer. So my mouse just took us backwards, I think. Here we go. So general tips on negotiations, um, be honest. Uh, the four Bs, this is why the four Bs are on the slides. Uh, be honest, be polite, be open, and be patient. Um, always keep the negotiation purpose and priorities to the forefront of your mind. Understand the issues that are important to your counterpart. counterpart. Um, and using open-ended questions um, is a very useful way to find out more information from your um, negotiating counterpart about their position. So for instance, don't ask what lead time or what price do you want, but what are your company's needs? Um, and this is an open-ended question. And then they will say more. You ask them a closed question, what lead time do you want? They will say, oh, eight weeks. But ask them what their needs are, and they will share more with you. And um, so understand them and understand their personality and their negotiating, their particular negotiating style. Be consistent in your arguments and actions. Revise or compromise your goals when new information challenges your position. Be careful of linking issues unnecessarily. Deal with issues independently, wherever possible, to avoid a deadlock. Um, good examples of this are the world trade agreements, where all the issues are linked, and the Brexit deal that's now going on, where all the issues are linked. So they can't, it's almost impossible to get to an agreement. So be careful of linking issues. Um, avoid making too many counter proposals. Um, because again, it, 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 um, it breaks things up. So you can come with counter proposals, but be careful of making counter proposals to every proposal you get. And be creative and flexible in exploring solutions. Always remain positive in your communications, whether they're verbal or nonverbal. Emphasize common ground in your comments. Um, summarize positions and points of agreement throughout negotiations and avoid making, avoid making negative or irritating comments. Always be positive. This will keep the air, it doesn't matter how difficult the negotiations are, it will keep the air as positive and the opportunity to reach a successful conclusion um, available. And do plan breaks in negotiation to allow for reflection. And um, your, your counterpart will probably want it too. Um, but it, it, you, you will definitely need it. I'm sure that you're going to be in a situation where you need to think about it, to find information and come back. And you can't allow yourself to be hurried um, straight through and then find yourself with a suboptimal deal. And strive to create a win-win deal. Negotiations are not just win-lose contests. Ideally, there should be something for both sides. So um, conditions for getting a win-win outcome are that the companies 
have shared goals and shared objectives. They have a commitment to work together to solve problems. They have trust in each other. They have open and accurate communication with each other. And each believes in the validity of the other's position. And win-win um, 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 outcomes include things like what is called expanding the pie. Um, so each side works to find value for the other party. Uh, or a log roll, identify issues where disagreement exists, and then each side trades off an issue. So, okay, we'll accept paying you a higher price if you can give us the shorter lead time we want. So this is a log roll. Or a cost cut is where both sides work together to find cost savings in how they work with each other. Um, and a bridge is, is about finding new solutions to problems that will satisfy both sides' needs. So um, negotiations can fail. And they will fail because um, either side does not commit sufficient time to the process, doesn't establish clear goals, doesn't format um, convincing arguments, doesn't consider their counterpart's needs, uh, or thinks that uh, we can do this kind of quick and done. Um, it's, it's a complex process. It's very important. It's, um, it's important to um, devote significant resources to get a successful outcome. And, um, and it should be a win for both sides because really that's the only truly um, um, valid outcome of a negotiation. So um, I'm going to click onto the next slide and I think we're going to start looking at legal issues. I think, is this Medita? Uh, Medita, you're on mute, but uh, before yeah. you start, we have uh, a question from uh, one of the attendees. Mr. Mohammed uh, Hamid. Rania, can you please uh, allow him to ask his question, please? <clears throat> the uh, unmuted. Okay. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we yes. can hear you. Please go ahead. <clears throat> yes, this is Mohammed Hamid from Jet Textile Egypt. It's um, um, ready made uh, garments uh, uh, factory in Egypt and first exporter to US and Europe. In, uh, 2019 and 18. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the best criteria to evaluate the suppliers? I have a lot of suppliers, so I need to, to know the best criteria to evaluate this supplier. Criteria to evaluate your suppliers? Yes, the best criteria. Um, well, I think- um... Such as, as Mrs. Francis mentioned, the, she mentioned, uh, uh, on-time delivery and something like this and quality. So I need to know the others. Uh, well, I yeah. believe what he's asking about is uh, how would a buyer evaluate his supplier? Are you talking about this, Mr. Hamid? Yes, 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 exactly. So not him uh, evaluating his suppliers, but a usual <clears throat> normal US buyer, how would he evaluate uh, a good supplier from a not a good supplier in Egypt? You probably would get some, ask for some references of the companies you've worked with before um, and find out, you know, what, whether you are uh, reliable enough for them to place orders with you. And that's really important. Obviously, you know, we're talking about doing business. And so they will probably check you out and want to know your history of who you've worked with in the past. Um, it's, it's really important to sort of get an understanding that you understand doing business uh, in America anyway, and making sure you understand the on-time delivery thing. Yes, I, I think they'd want to see any certifications that you have. Um, so so do, do, do the companies have uh, certifications uh, for, for, for quality management, for environmental compliance, social compliance? Um, they, they may want, uh, I'm pretty sure they would want to um, understand your financial side. They want suppliers who are, going, who are financially viable. Um, so they would, they would want this. I think they would normally send a um, 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 visit um, your, your organization 
and uh, they would also want to um, know where are you sourcing inputs from and they would want to know about those businesses too uh, because if if you're sourcing um, a significant significant inputs from a factory um, which um, then is unethical in its labor practices or similar um, then this can reflect on their brand and yeah. so they they want to have visibility all the way back up the supply chain and well, um, sorry, sorry. Peter, yeah. yeah i would say oh my my the screen goes black every time I speak. Um, I would also say that uh, they may have the bigger bigger stores have agents, and the agents may be working um, working in Egypt uh, with other companies. So they may have some background on you, or they can contact agents that they pay to inspect your facilities. Um, they may come and meet you, um, send an agent to meet with you at your facility so they can check it out. We're talking about bigger orders, of course. So, yes, uh, it is important that you uh, have everything you say you have because they may even, you know, send people to inspect your factories. I know I've been to many, many factories. And, you know, if you go to China, you'll see they've got stamps of approval from like we we're talking about Nike or guests or whoever else they're working with, they'll have these big boards on the wall to say these are the companies they've worked with. And so it shows that, that and also that they, how the workers are working um, is also an important part to particularly moving forward now in this environment. Yeah, and, and dependability. Dependability is a critical issue for, for for companies, because they're competing in, in highly competitive um, markets. And so they want to be sure that their suppliers are dependability. So that's one thing they're looking at. Can, are you going to be dependable? If you say you will deliver in eight weeks, will you deliver in eight weeks? And um, if you say you'll deliver in two weeks, will you deliver in two weeks? So dependability is a, is a critical requirement for, for suppliers. So all, all what we discussed, uh, I think, is that based on my experience, you have to create a sourcing manual for your company. Uh, you have to create a sourcing manual and you have to put in that sourcing manual all your suppliers, how you are working with them, what is the quality level, what is the uh, delivery lead time, what are the prices, uh, that you can give it to the buyer and the buyer can contact those suppliers and then actually um, get uh, get the uh, job done. So the tool that you have to use is something called a sourcing manual that I have worked with companies and I have asked them to create that so that uh, you can actually, you can give that. It can be electronic, it can be physical. So I think uh, I, think I need to move on uh, um, respecting the time. And I saw you trying to tell something you want to tell. You're muted. No, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Okay, and so you're muted. Sorry? No, sorry? Anne, uh, Anne is trying to tell you something, but Anne is muted. We cannot we hear can... you, Anne. Uh, we All cannot right. hear you. Yeah, she said that's fine to go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so before you move on, uh, Madita, there was another question. Uh, that we received sure. in the Q&A section. Will you be able to answer to it as well? Uh, yeah, let me, uh, let's uh, It was, how could Egyptian suppliers get into hitting target pricing competition with Chinese suppliers? Yes, the only way you can do that is you have to improve your efficiency and you have to produce at that, uh, with that cost. Uh, I mean, if you want to compete in pricing, the only way you can do is to reduce your cost. And uh, because I don't think unless, unless um, um, you know, you want to be, um, if a buyer is comparing you and a company in China, uh, and if you have the same capabilities, provided that your quality levels are same, your deliveries are all same, comparing that, the only way you can do is to reduce the cost uh, and Jill can probably jump in how to reduce the cost. Well, I was actually going to jump in and say that sometimes it's not easy to compete with, with companies in China. However, with 
the US and with our moderately shifting trade policies with China on a regular basis, um, <clears throat> A lot of companies are moving away from manufacturing in China because of the unstable tariff situation. So if you can provide fairly competitive pricing on the products you're producing, understand that you're the, the tariffs or the duties that, that the US would be paying to import from Egypt um, are very different than what they would be paying to import goods from China. So that can actually work to your advantage. Um, so I would say that I, probably recommend trying to stay on top of products coming in from China, especially the types of products that we're importing that do have very high tariff rates. And if that's an area that you produce goods in, that is something that can be advantageous for you to discuss with your customers. Because we know that um, tariff and duty rates coming in from Egypt are significantly more stable than what we're dealing with in Asia these days. Will that answer your question? Okay, let's let's move on then, Medita. Okay. Um, so um, I will ask you to move the slides, Dr. Kilda. Yes. So um, so let's talk about the legal uh, considerations uh, very quickly. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so, but I'm trying to share some information that is maybe important uh, for the um, manufacturers and the um, and the attendees today. Um, so I think before we move on to actually legally a legal uh, a content, it's it's also important to take a look at the um, the Federal Trade Commission uh, website ftc.gov and try to understand uh, the, um, uh, what, what content is there in terms of protecting American consumers. Like for example, the labeling and labeling laws. Uh, this is uh, specifically interesting to me because when I was working uh, for a brand in the United States, uh, in working um, in developing a product with China, I had a situation where um, that I have to give all the information about the labels, but th there's always opportunity for the manufacturer actually to go to FTC and find out information uh, quite quickly about labels and labeling laws. Uh, and because of that, in fact, we had to cancel an order that I placed in China, uh, not cancel, but the order came in, but at the distribution center, there was one part of that was going to Canada and the other part was United States. So that because of the Canada number and the RN number are different, we had to replace all the labels at the distribution center. So things, uh, small things like that, uh, as manufacturers, it is good to take a look at uh, these kind of um, resources. Also um, the compliance. Uh, it is also a good idea to take a look at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission website. Uh, and in fact, um, there's a guide to United States apparel and household textile compliance requirement that was published and revised in 2016. Uh, it's about a 32 page document. I think um, I recommend the manufacturers actually take a look at it because these things provide a lot of very important information if you are planning to do business uh, in, in the United States. In fact, that document uh, was published by the National Insti Institute of Standards and Technology uh, of the um, US Department of Commerce. Um, uh, and the, the links are here. So you can actually um, click on these links and uh, um, go to those websites. Uh, can I go to the next slide, please, Dr. Kinder? Sure. So um, US legal system, uh, the, uh, it's also important that if you can understand what type of a legal system US has, especially when if you are planning to um, operate a business in the United States, if you plan to open an office 
uh, and uh, do business in the United States. So um, it, it's, a, it's a complex legal system because you have federal laws, you have state laws, and you have uh, local uh, cities and county laws uh, in all 50 states, along with the um, US territories and the District of Columbia. So uh, say for example, if you think of a pattern, a pattern uh, is, is a, um, uh, it comes under the federal. And if you're talking about a business contract, it comes under the state. So it is also good to you know, kind of understand this. Of course, I'm not a lawyer and you have to get kind of legal counsel and none of us are lawyers unless you have your own lawyers in your company. Uh, but I think the, um, the Apparel Export Council, the Textile Export Council, um, those resources, I mean, those um, associations can actually um, provide some of this information um, also to the companies, as I understand. So, um, if you are opening up a business in the United States, like a branch office or a corporation or a limited liability company or a partnership, uh, it's important to understand the legal um, aspects of it because uh, they have different uh, benefits, different requirements. Um, and uh, also when you think of that, you also have to think of the banking, the immigration laws, um, so it is, it's very, it's complex. So it is important that you hire a legal uh, a, a lawyers uh, in order to do that. And if, when you do the negotiation and putting things in contract. Next slide, please, Dr. Kumar. And the, the US has a very complex uh, tax laws. So um, careful tax planning is very important for companies doing business in US, uh, especially if you're planning to start a, um, a branch office or whatnot in the United States. Uh, there's separate federal, uh, state and local tax laws. So it is important to understand that and you can actually hire tax lawyers for that. Um, so if you're planning to open up an entity in the United States, you need to get a employer identification number from Internal Revenue Service uh, and uh, that is the way that you set up your taxing uh, system. Uh, things like uh, transfer pricing, which is uh, foreign companies doing business in the US cannot shift profits uh, for foreign parent company to avoid taxes. Um, and the IRS will be after you if you try to do that. So you cannot claim that you have this much of cost for your business and you don't have that much of um, profit, so you're not going to pay taxes for the profits. Uh, you can do that, so that's illegal. So things like this is important to understand. You also, could, I, sorry. Sorry, Maditha, I was just gonna say you, you could get some advice from Donald Trump when it comes to US taxes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so um, also- what, uh, What's that, don't pay them? Sorry. <laughs> So um, uh, tax treaties, it's also important to understand. I'm sure you all who are doing business already, you understand what those tra uh, tax treaties are. And uh, it is to you know, facilitate the commerce between the countries and uh, um, also to prevent actually double taxation and tax evasion. So it's, it's important to understand that as well. So um, let's move, in, move into the intellectual property side of it. Uh, so um, the US has um, robust intellectual property laws uh, to protect the intangible assets. So as you know, there are four types of the patents, the trademarks, copyrights, and uh, trade secrets. So for example, foreign companies uh, cannot infringe a patent uh, as well as they cannot enforce their patent in the United States until, unless they are not selling that product or that particular, um, the, the patent, uh, the, the product that has that patent in other markets. So um, with regard to trademarks, uh, you can secure a trademark 
by registering uh, in the US patent office. Uh, and of course, it is not as stressful as uh, getting a patent. Um, so there are a lot of information with regard to the, the, these patents, trademarks, copyrights, and things like that. I think uh, it's important to understand uh, this area as well if you are planning to do business and if you are uh, working with companies on developing products uh, which, are, which can be patented or um, the, 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 uh, if you have uh, logos or whatnot that can be trademarked. Uh, next slide, please, Dr. Um, the copyrights, uh, the artworks, the prints that you develop with your buyers, uh, and if they need to get cop, they, they have to be copyrighted. Uh, it has to be uh, very, you have to be very careful with these things because um, these things can get real, uh, can get real ugly in, in terms of uh, lawsuits and things like that. Um, again, I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm just sharing this information. So please do not uh, expect me to answer your legal questions if you have any later on, but uh, um, I think it is also very important to understand uh, this aspect of it. May I pop in there with this copyright yes. issue? Um, yes. I am hired as an expert for a, a number of cases and most of them are to do with copyright issues. So what happens is um, a domestic manufacturer may choose some print here from a domestic uh, domestic textile house and once the print is made into a sample they show it to the buyers and the buyers will say that's costing too much how can we cut this down so they may send it to China to produce or outside the country to have it produced at a cheaper cheaper cost to bring the cost of the fabrics down, the cost of the goods, then obviously will relate to that. So this is a huge issue. And then what happens is all the goods are shipped over to America, they're hanging in Macy's or wherever, and the uh, creator of that print sees this, a textile company sees their print uh, hanging there, and it may have been manipulated a little bit, but it still looks the same. Believe me, you do not want to get into any of this because there are they not only the retailer has to pay the manufacturer has to play as well so be very careful when you're dealing with prints that you have uh, access to understanding who owns the copyright you don't don't be tempted to uh, if they ask you oh we want something like this one one example was a peace sign and that somebody else was claiming there are you have to be or they they've manipulated it what they think it's a big mistake. We hear it in colleges. Oh, if you scan it in and change it 30%, then it can become yours. No, it can't. So be very careful that you understand who you're working with when it comes to prints, who owns the copyright. Very, very important topic. Sorry. Thanks, Francis. Yeah, thank you, Francis. Um, so real quickly, um, the last slide that I can, I will discuss here is the, um, of course, the trade secrets. So trade secrets are something that uh, you may not be able to patent yet, uh, but are very important for your business. Like for example, a manufacturing technique or a manufacturing process, um, you have to protect that. So um, the US provide for that. And in fact, uh, I think there was uh, a law that came in in 2016 um, under the federal law, um, to uh, under something called the passage of the Defend Trade Secret Act, uh, because uh, um, there was a lot of discussion that uh, companies all over the world are copying their intellectual property and, and, and stealing uh, these things. So, um, but uh, uh, I think these kind of things can be protected uh, through the non-disclosure agreements. If you have a company here and if you want if you want to protect that, you can have an NDA with your employees. The employer can have an NDA with employees uh, because they are- NDA. Uh, non-disclosure agreement. Non-disclosure agreement. I said that earlier. So, okay. um, and you can protect that. Uh, and, and the uh, United States uh, legal system provide for that. Uh, another thing that I found uh, when I was looking for legal consideration for to do business is also uh, important to know the 
anti-discrimination laws for employees. As you may be working with you know, employees, if you have a business in the US, it is important to know the legal system because um, it's, it's quite strict um, considering the uh, anti-discrimination laws enforced. The, so the federal and state laws uh, use, usually prohibit discrimination based on employee uh, or potential employee based on their race, color, national origin, religion, and so on and so forth. So it is also important to uh, uh, know that. And I have the source here, if you want to refer to that, this is from a legal um, a law firm that is talking about this information. So uh, I think, um, Dr. Kela, we can move to the next slide. I think it will be Francis. So no, this is a really Francis. huge, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. So this is a, a topic that uh, everybody needs to be involved in. The consumers are demanding sustainability. Uh, you've got the Gen X and the, the millennials, they're looking for anything to do with sustainable. A lot of them are actually buying from secondhand stores. So please make sure that you have some sustainability in the facts that we're we're polluting the industry, the industry is polluting globally, uh, ending up in landfills. It doesn't biodegrade unless it's made from um, certain types of textiles that are biodegradable. And of course, your Egyptian cotton is one. So making sure that you have some aspect of sustainability within your factory. And I've spoken to a couple of the factories that I'm working with in Egypt, and they have set in place some some eco-friendly uh, strategies which I, which I like. Um, first of all, they may be giving the scraps to their workers to take home and maybe turning them into rugs or the other one was giving the scraps and they were making them into um, draft stoppers along the wall. Um, that they're, That's just one small part, but it goes from the very beginning, what kind of fabrics you're choosing, what kind of threads you're using, what kind of packaging, all these things are going into sustainability. And people are thinking about this. The stores are being um, very careful to incorporate some kind of sustainability. So there are certifications that you can look into and they're listed on this slide. Um, just try to have maybe a meeting, a general meeting with your managers and thinking about how can you incorporate this type of, any type of sustainability within your own uh, factories. Um, we are looking now more and more, and of course, you know, everybody wants to have these huge orders, but you know, what happens if these orders don't sell? They're then thrown away even before this, not even worn. So on-demand manufacturing, and we're seeing, uh, we did a, a session with one company called On Point, and Jill probably knows them, um, they do, I think they're in the middle, I think they may be, I know they're in the middle of America somewhere and they've been backed to have this factory to be totally, um, mostly, what would you say, robots are cutting. Uh, you can actually have the garments scanned in to made to measure to the person. They're cut individually. They're moved then to the sewers who understand how to produce the goods. It's all automated. So it's, well, except for the, of course, the, the sewers, but the so then put it down on the table it moves to the next person it moves to then there's one garment made after another maybe medusa probably knows a lot about this as well so on demand is also part of sustainability so what's your story if you don't have sustainability within your business please think about sitting down and analyzing where you can adjust or begin in some way to create a sustainable story. This will then be on your website and people will want to know what is it you're doing. We're seeing a lot of uh, companies here recycling, uh, upcycling, taking goods and, and taking them apart and putting them back together again. Or we're seeing uh, bigger brands, even uh, Versace and some of the bigger brands here will take back Louis Vuitton. They will take back their goods that have been sold and used. They are buying them back to resale. And you're seeing, even seeing, they're buying them back and they may be 20 years old uh, in perfect condition. They're selling for a higher price 
than the than, than they did originally. So these are all things that you need to consider how you can begin to, to with the sustainability story, and also, of course, uh, making sure your workers are treated in uh, a fair way. So these are, as I say, important to think about, and happy to talk about it later on. Thank you, Peter. Okay, so we get to our um, final slide. Um, um, and um, I, I, um, we want to solicit questions from you, um, but um, um, looking at um, actually when Anne shared this slideshow, um, her contribution to the slideshow, um, she put the date on it um, and she, she put it down as, um, uh, November the tw uh, uh, sorry 22nd of November 2020 22 11 2020 the and and I think just about anywhere else on the planet has that anywhere on the planet has that format for date day month year but in the United States the format is month day year so in the United States we note the today's date as 11 22 2020. So when you have a contract um, that says um, uh, 5, 5 11, 20, then it means um, that is actually May the 11th, um, not the 5th of November. And um, that's just an important point to remember. If you're dealing with American companies in noting dates on contracts and things like that, they're going to switch the day and the month around. So it's November the 22nd. So I'd like to apologize um, now, for everybody in America. Say again. I said I'd like to apologize for everybody in America on, on, <laughs> on that issue. That and our the fact that we refuse to use metric in terms of measurement and we only use imperial measurement. However, That's most the, companies are are able to convert metric to imperial and imperial to metric. Just not the date. We're not ganging up on you. <laughs> the, the United States, that's US exceptionalism. And it's interesting, it's the last bastion of English measurements. So, um, um, so now it's your turn. So um, what, what do you find to be the biggest challenges in dealing with US companies? So, so what questions do you have? And maybe some comments on, on what you find to be the biggest challenges in dealing with US companies? I see yeah. that. Questions, uh, Yasmin? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, please go ahead, Mudita. Please go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I see uh, some questions coming up. So let me, um, should I read, Yasmin? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I'll read it to the panel and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, address that. So um, Jabala Matar um, asking, we already manufacture and export to the United States. However, we are struggling to gain new clients. Apart from traveling to the United States, how can we contact and obtain new clients? <clears throat> so I, would say I think we I think we already said that you know your your website is is first of all an important tool. Um, Francis and Anne are helping companies with that process. Maybe maybe either of you have some comments on this. Yes, I, I, oh, I can I just... jump in here. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. So, oh, um, so finally, you can hear me. That's nice. My microphone is working again. Um, so what we recommend is besides of the website and having your digital presence really tight and clear and communicating your services, it's really about also reaching out proactively through you can use LinkedIn. We with our Francis and I work with the companies on really leveraging LinkedIn as a tool, but then it is really like the other option you have, of course, is getting your, your marketing mix ready and doing also like you can do um, like social media advertising, but in general, like at least from my experience, really reaching out via LinkedIn or going through expert like you can go through other databases in the US um, or wholesaling databases, depending what your target group is. Um, that's normally our recommendation. But Francis, please, please also jump in. 
Yeah, and I also think, of course, you know, the biggest draw is when you do a live trade show. I mean, this is when you're meeting people and they're passing your booth and they they'll stop and look, you know. So, and now we're we built that online platform for well, this magic did for the sourcing. So, how do you attract people? Um, and that was the, one of the things we talked about with some of the companies is that's your showroom. So merchandise your goods, although it's, of course, it's all virtual. Merchandise the goods so it can tell a story. Um, if they go into your showroom and they see it's just a jumble and it's hard to understand, they're going to leave again. So, uh, but one of the things that you can check, uh, check is who, who entered that. And then follow up with a little email. Hey, I saw you came in. I, I you know I'm sorry we didn't get to talk. Can you maybe um, let me know how we can help you? And maybe you, you've checked them out as well. Like uh, Anne was saying that through the LinkedIn, you can probably find out who exactly and what they do. But you, you need to follow through. Follow through is really it's a really important part. And you know we're looking at this first time online trade shows. Um, which is where I say, you know, there's nothing like the excitement of a live show where you're meeting people constantly and new doors open, even if it's, and they have matchmaking as well. And that's another thing that you'll need to prepare for. The next show they're doing is going to be the 2nd of March. It's going to be only two months, and not three. And there is that window before the show starts where you can contact there and they've actually employed uh, a, a new employee who's going to be the buyer uh, relations person who she used to work for me actually Trish so that's going to be the person that you need to be um, looking at be before you go don't leave it to last minute get in touch with the agents and find out who is coming to the show so that you can reach out prior or you'll know how to address it knowing who is coming so again do a little of investigation again mar um, merchandising visual we're, we're in a visual business what you wear is saying who you are and it's about uh what you're showing is showing who you are so it's important that you do follow through with merchandising your products to tell a story so that that i would say you know not to be too long-winded but that's something you need to seriously think about right uh, and, and also work Go on, go Sorry. on, Joe. Okay. What what I would like to say about LinkedIn is I think I use LinkedIn almost every day. I think it's a very powerful professional networking tool. And having said that, what I would recommend is when you are trying to connect with people or companies on LinkedIn, don't just send an invitation. Make sure that when you're using it, if, if you use LinkedIn from your phone, it doesn't allow you to send a note. If you are using LinkedIn from your computer, it does actually allow you to send a note when you're creating an invitation to connect with someone. I highly recommend that you send a personalized note to the person or the companies you're trying to connect with. And even more so, when you are sending that personalized note, make sure that you are addressing the correct person that you want to connect with, don't just send a blanket invitation. I receive a lot of blanket invitations from companies, mostly in China, asking me to connect and they're manufacturing products. I do nothing with manufacturing, so I already know, well, I mean, I, I don't manufacture myself. I, I know a lot about manufacturing, but I myself don't manufacture. I don't do anything with product. So when I receive an invitation from a company trying to connect with me, because they're a factory and they're looking for sources in the US, I already know that they haven't looked at my profile. They don't know who they're trying to connect with. When you're trying to make that personal connection with whomever, take the time to read the profile, send, a, it doesn't have to be a personalized paragraph long, but please send a very personalized note to that person you're much more likely to receive a positive response from them rather than them just deleting the invitation because they don't know you. And you're more likely to make an impression with them so that when they do connect with you, you can send them a message and say, introduce yourself, introduce your company. These are the types of products that we make. Are you interested? Can we set up some time to speak? And that's what I would recommend in terms of using LinkedIn for professional networking of any sort. 
Thanks, Jill. And, and I've got one thing to add, and that is um, if you're a garment company, work with the Apparel Export Council. If you're a textile company, work with the Textile Export Council. These two organizations have great resources to help connect you to your mar international markets. And, um, and I know that they have, um, they attend, they have pavilions, Egypt, Egypt pavilions. Um, I found that doing collaborate, collaborative um, exhibitions is good like that for spreading costs where you're part of a pavilion rather than just having your own um, um, freestanding um, setup. And they can also plug you into to the um, Egyptian consulates or around the United States to help you reach out to, to potential buyers um, through that network. So um, work with your um, apparel, with the Apparel Export Council, or if you're a textile company, the Textile Export Council. Um, Thank you, Peter, for that. Uh, I think we are uh, already 15 minutes past uh, seven in Cairo, but we're actually having another question that uh, that uh, that we want to, to answer to. It's also from Jabala Matar uh, asking about, I would also like to ask about investing in seamless machinery. Does it have a future in the textile industry? This is from Aditha. Yeah. So let me jump in. Um, um, I would not say yes, and I would not say no. Uh, the reason is seamless technology has developed so much. Um, if you, this is an example I take when I taught like the production class. When Michael Phelps won the uh, Olympics, uh, seven or eight gold medals, his, his suit that he wore had an 8% advantage over all the other athletes because the seams were constructed seamless by gluing technology. So that itself gives you an answer. Of course, yes, because the seamless, uh, the gluing technology actually get rid of the color matching of the thread. We have been talking about color boxes for sewing machines so that you don't need to change the thread color where you can click on a, a button and you can change the color from blue to red, red to yellow so that you don't need to go through all the changing of the thread from the needle to the bobbin in, in case of overlocks and stuff like that, multiple threads. So we can get rid of that requirement with the seamless technology. Uh, I have myself worked on seamless technology when I was in the industry and uh, creating lingerie, there's a, there's a huge demand for seamless technology, um, for bras, panties, and so on and so forth. And I would say the first thing uh, that you have to do is you need to see what opportunities you have. You have to do a little bit of market research and see what type of garments you can produce. Are you producing that particular garment? Uh, can you do that in seamless? Uh, and who are the buyers who are buying this seamless? What are the opportunities? You have to do a little bit of market research. So that's why I said, I will say yes or no, but it depends on what you can do. Investing, uh, when I was working, I, um, we, I asked a company in China, in Guangdong province to invest on almost 50 machines because they were so smart. They were doing a very good job. They, invest, they invested in, and we got a full order that was actually previously given to Victoria's Secret to the company that I worked. I worked for Made in Form that time. So it all depends on your capabilities and who you are catering for, who your buyers are, and what other buyers that you can actually touch on. Okay, so, so if you're competing in the swimming events at next year's Olympics, you definitely need Seamless. Yes. Uh -huh. Any any other questions? How sustainable is that, Medusa? Um, they are as they are as sustainable as uh, sewing threads, uh, because we are using a lot of polyester. So I mean, I would say polyester recyclable. You can get beamy step, which is used in the seamless uh, 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 construction, which is you know recyclable. And what about it? So, and the glued ones, the seamless ones. 
So it's a, either, either ultrasonic bonding or that sort of machines that it's you can heat use. Heat bonding, heat bonding. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's like frequency. Interesting. So how expensive are the equipment? It's quite an investment, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's comparable. We, we bought an ultrasonic bonding machine about probably three, four years ago. It's, it's as comparable as any other heavy duty uh, uh, machine. It may be a little more, but, uh, but you know, the, the time saving in terms of uh, changing sewing threads and things like that probably can be um, uh, cost effective. Again, uh, you know, I don't have experience in working in a seamless um, factory. So I don't know, I can't exactly say when you compare with the single needle lock stitch versus uh, um, ultrasonic bonding, um, you know, two, three uh, um, stitch type, that, that pattern type seamless uh, seam. Uh, I, I, can, I haven't done a study on comparing the speeds and stuff like that, but, but again, it, it gives you that opportunity not to worry about color of sewing thread, which you know, sometimes you have to dye to match. Uh, or you have to match the color. So those kind of, you know, again, it's, uh, I can't say yes or no right away. It has to be, you have to do a little bit of uh, uh, study on that, depending on what type of garments you produce. Thanks, Baditha. So any more questions or comments, anybody? I think people are tired or at the end of the day. <laughs> so maybe okay. this is the reason why, because I can't see to see any raised hands or uh, more questions on the on the chatting. So By the way, I just Peter, is that Trump with a on little the golf bit of And uh, of course the important one one of the, the important things in American business is is golf. And um, I am I am not a golfer myself, but um, Get out there on the golf course and practice your swing. You might meet Trump. Yes. <laughs> Thanks so much for the fruitful uh, presentation. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for allowing us to take up part of your day. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. I just want to mention before we end this meeting that uh, this is the first session from a series of uh, webinars to follow. The coming one will be on December 6th, and it will be focusing on marketing strategy and building your company brand, as well as uh, sustainability for the US market. Uh, it will give an overview of strategies, resources, and perspective on uh, value creation. And then uh, in the following sessions will be also uh, tackling other uh, topics like building a strong workforce and management for export success, go to market strategy and business development for the US market. And finally, uh, the last session will cover design and merchandising strategies to meet market and buyer requirements in the US. So I hope uh, today's uh, session was, uh, was helpful to everyone. And uh, I thank you all. Uh, thank, thank you, you Medita, yes, thank you, Peter, thank yes, you, Jill. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Francis. I just took them uh, the names uh, as I'm seeing them on the screen. And uh, I'll switch to Arabic. Shukran gazilan li jamia al hadur li wujudkun naharda. We atamanna lo fi aya asila aw aya haga hadratku tiqdaru tibatuha bil email fa ayuat aw hatta titkallimu ala al telefon ala nahabdito ala al chat. We hadar asaidku insha Allah. And bezat lil shirikat illa habba na tsharik fil mashroo. Later on, in the other uh, to share, like in the still, and then a uh, force in the share, get the location shark and it adopted whole my item. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Have a nice evening. Have a nice evening. Time for a walk. Bye bye.